I won an international science fair, and ever since then, a bunch of people have been asking me, how on earth could a 15-year-old have won an international science fair? My response, a ton of hard work and a lot of failures. And recently I've developed a novel paper sensor for the detection of pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer. And the sensor is 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than the current standard of detection. <laughs> the best part, it costs three cents and, and takes five minutes to run. Now, you might be wondering why 15-year-olds is interested in pancreatic cancer. Shouldn't I be watching movies or playing video games? Well, actually, I became interested in pancreatic cancer because a close family friend who was like an uncle to me passed a pancreatic cancer. And then what I did is I began to wonder how could someone have gone from a healthy human being who expressed really no symptoms to a human skeleton in as short as three months? So then I began going to Google, my go-to source for information, and what I found was shocking. Over 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late. That's two of those people. And 2% survive. And so that ha creates an abysmal five-year survival rate, 5.5%. That's the worst of any cancer. And so then I began to wonder, why are we so bad at detecting pancreatic cancer? We have to have a better way. And what I discovered on Google was that today's modern medicine is a 60-year-old technique. That's older than my dad. And <laughs> it's grossly inaccurate. It misses 30% of all pancreatic cancers. In addition, it's pricey. It costs $800, meaning that it's not an option to lower income patients as it's not covered by your insurance plan. In addition, you have to pay for doctor's fees and all these different associated fees with it. So it's really a really crappy way, to be honest. <laughs> So I was sure there had to be a better way of detecting pancreatic cancer. So I went online again, and I looked at what an optimal sensor would look like. It would have to be inexpensive, rapid, simple, sensitive, minimally invasive, and it would have to be pretty accurate at detecting the cancer. And so then I was pretty sure I could do this, but I wasn't quite sure how. So then I went online, and I realized why we haven't made such a discovery yet. The reason being is when you're trying to detect pancreatic cancer, you're essentially looking for a protein that's found in your blood when you have these different types of cancers. Now, this sounds really straightforward, but it's anything but. What you have is these liters and liters of blood, and you're looking for this tiny increase in this tiny amount of blood or, or of protein, and that's next to impossible. It's kind of like finding a needle in a stack of nearly identical needles. So then I went online again, and I had to first find a potential biomarker that I was looking for, this one protein. I started with a database of 8,000 different proteins. And luckily on the 4,000th try, I finally hit gold. And I was next to insanity at that point. But it's called mesothelin. And mesothelin is just your ordinary run-of-the-mill type of protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, or lung cancer, in which case it's found at these greatly increased levels. And also, the key here is that this mesothelin, it's found the earliest stages of the cancer, when survival rates are close to 100%. So if you can detect this protein, then you can potentially detect pancreatic cancer, ovarian, and lung cancer all in their earliest stages. So then I had to actually figure out how to detect this protein. That was the big question here. And so it came in the most unlikely of places, my high school biology class, the absolute stifler of innovation. And <laughs> So I kind of snuck in this research paper on carbon nanotubes, and I was reading it under my desk. And you might be wondering, what on earth is a carbon nanotube? And it's actually this, these really cool things, these long cylindrical pipes that are 150,000th the diameter of your hair. However, they have these incredible properties, like they conduct electricity better than silver and copper, but also they just have these incredible properties. They're kind of like superheroes, in a sense, if you're a scientist. And so then what happened is we are learning in biology class I was supposed to be paying attention to antibodies. And antibody is essentially like a lock and key. It binds specifically to only one specific protein, in this case, the mesothelin protein. And so then I began rolling around this idea of how I would connect my carbon nanotubes to what I was supposed to be paying attention to. And then it hit me. 
I could essentially lace these nanotubes with the antibody, and I would have a network that would react only with that specific protein. And in this case, would generate an uh, electrical response that was large enough to measure with the Home Depot ohm meter that cost $50. And so then I well, had to get a lab space can, since I can't do cancer research on my kitchen table. And what I did is I emailed essentially anyone that had anything to do with pancreatic cancer. And what I included was like my procedure, my timeline, budget, really an entire grant proposal. And all two, like, 200 people is how many I responded to. I was flying through those emails. And I got 199 rejections and one maybe. And so finally, after three months, I hunted down that maybe professor, and finally I landed the meeting with him. And getting into a lab isn't as simple as it's cracked up to be. Because what you have to do is I went through this huge interview. It was this interrogation. And the professor is pulling in more and more and more of these experts in my field. And eventually, I get through all these questions. I guessed on a few of them. <laughs> and I land the lab space that I needed. And at first, nothing was working. <laughs> at first, nothing was working. I expected I would waltz into that lab, and it would magically work in like the first week. Psych. It actually took seven months. <laughs> Cancer research isn't that easy. and so. Finally, after those seven months, I finally had one small paper sensor that could detect pancreatic cancer with 100% accuracy, and it was tested in blind studies with humans. Now then, through this, I've learned one really important lesson, that through the internet, anything is possible. You don't have to be a professor with multiple degrees to have your ideas valued, regardless of your age, your gender, your ethnicity, whatever. It's just your ideas. And so what What's really important to me, what I find really important in the internet, is that instead of posting duck-faced pictures of yourself or, <laughs> taking pic or taking pictures of your food and posting them on Instagram, you could be changing the world. I did all of my research on Google and Wikipedia. One more thing is that a bunch of people are nowadays saying that the world's kind of going, like the US is driving the world into like this free fall and we're going to soon like just explode. But in my opinion, we're just getting started. You see, what happened is in the 1970s at the Olympics, all these records were being broken. Do you want to know why? <laughs> well, actually what happened is a bunch of African countries and other countries, millions more people could compete for, to, for their um, country to go to the Olympics. All these records were broken. That's what's happening nowadays. The internet is becoming accessible to 3.5 billion more people. And when they have access to that internet, they could be like me. There are millions more of me out there. When I started this research, I didn't know I even had a pancreas. <laughs> So if a 15-year-old who didn't know he had a pancreas could develop a new sensor for pancreatic cancer that cost three cents and five minutes to run, imagine what those 3.5 billion people could do and just imagine what you could do. Thank you.